Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Global Report. I'm your host, Lily Ong. We have with us today Mayor Manuel Araujo, who is the mayor of Kilimani, Kilimani, City, Kilimani yes. City in Mozambique. Welcome to the show, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank it's, you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for being here. Now, Mr. Mayor, um, the, the country of Mozambique has quite a history. Um, if we could spend a little time talking about that, I understand that you went through four, 400 years of Portuguese rule and finally achieved your independence in 1975. However, two years after the achievement of independence, the country went into, got into a civil war. Yes. What happened there? Well, you did your homework. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, we had, uh, as you mentioned, I think um, Vasco da Gama, when he was on his way to discover to commerce India, he went uh, through Mozambique and actually stopped in Kelimane. That's why the river which uh, goes through Kelimane, it's called uh, River of Good Signs mm. or Rio dos Bons Sinais in Portuguese because it was in Kelimane w where Vasco da Gama was sure, he got the assurances that he was on the right path to India. Uh, because there was an Arab uh, uh, trader. trader who had done the opposite, like from India to Kilimane, so to, to buy things, then to take there. So in Kilimane, he was sure that he was on the right path. Uh, indeed, from there, it started a process where uh, Portuguese people, s Portuguese settlers, will come to Mozambique, uh, first of all, for trade. But in then more and more they start settling in and of course they start ruling. So that period went uh, from al al almost 500 years. And uh, in 1964, uh, a struggle, three movements came together to create a united front to wage First of all, they wanted to negotiate. Are you but talking about the war of independence? Yes, so of, oh, yes, of yeah. independence. Mm -hmm. Then, the, but the Portuguese they didn't want to grant independence. Unlike the English or the British who gave the independence without any fighting, the Portuguese said, "No, we are not giving you because you are not prepared." So Mozambique couldn't take it, of course. So they organized themselves and they waged a ten years guerrilla war against the Portuguese to achieve independence. And uh, the reason why I'm stressing the idea of a common front uh, is that after independence, the leadership of the front decided that they were going, in the context of the Cold War, they decided that they are going to align with the Soviet bloc because of the support that the, the Soviet bloc gave, logistic support f to wage the g g guerrilla war during the, the 10 years. Uh, so then they, they, were, they were getting support from Soviet Union and Cuba and, and, well. China, and China and China oh. mainly China and Soviet, Soviet Union. Union uh, so they decided to copy in the past the so-called uh, Marxism Leninism mm -hmm. to Mozambique. Uh, but, but of course it didn't work because the circumstances were different. The levels of um, uh, the, the economy, the what they call the productive forces, were not developed to 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 be declared as a socialist country. So then a division started within the group. Some were saying, "Well, look, when we are fighting, we never decided that we are going to be Marxist-Leninist. You know, we decided to become independent. Then we will have free and fair elections. Then we will decide which system we wanted." Is this the opposition party speaking now? I mean, it wasn't uh, op 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 opposition then, but then they became opposition. That's a renamo. Yeah, okay. be because they were saying, no, wait, we cannot go this route because there was no ref uh, any consultation process. There was no referendum, there was no uh, any constitutional assembly to, to decide. How can you by yourself decide for the world nation? Uh, and then because there was a coup d'etat in Lisbon, which was our col colonizer, then the transfer of power was quite messy. Mm. So the Freelium Party took power as a result of an agreement with the then uh, newly established uh, government in Lisbon and uh, independence was declared in, on the 25th of June 1975. Mm. Of course the, the new government came, they tried, they abolished 
private property, they nationalized education, they nationalized health, like we, you couldn't exist, for, for example, uh, liberal professions like lawyers and so you couldn't be a lawyer or you, you couldn't have uh, your own factory or if you had two they would take one so everything was government owned exactly so like they decided to to become or to make the country uh, not a market economy but uh, a central uh, planned economy uh, copied under the Soviet model. Now, all this time, the country was under um, President Marshall. Marshall, that, okay. that that was Marshall who proclaimed the, the independence. And then, two years after independence, of course, uh, a, a civil war b b broke up. First of all, it was very contained, but then, because of the increasing discontent, because like they almost banned religion, you couldn't go to a church. I mean, for you to go to church, you had to ask for permission. For you to move from one city to visit your daughter or, or your your mother in another city, you had to go. You had to ask for permission. So, people start beca becoming very anxious about Were it. Were they promoting a particular? religion? Not at all. No. Actually, actually, okay. actually, they said that religion was the opium of the people. So like they were oh, against any kind of re religion and they declared uh, a state as a non-religious -re state. Now during the civil war was there any foreign intervention? Uh, not in terms, unlike what happened in Angola where you had the Cubans, you had the South Africans and others, in Mozambique it was a kind of proxy war. Like uh, Renamo would have the support of South Africa and other, while uh, the government would have support, for example, from Cuba, from Soviet Union, from the East German. But in terms of, uh, for example, of aircraft for the government, in terms of uh, guns in terms of bullets uh, in logistics not men the only men from foreign countries that will come will be for example like special ad 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 military advisors mm. but yes so the intervention in mozambique foreign intervention was quite different from what happened in angola because in angola you had for example cuban soldiers fighting against south african soldiers in Ang 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 angolan soil mm. we our case was a fight between Mozambicans, but with the support mm. of uh, either regional powers or in the context of the Cold War uh, with the so Soviet Union. So they were interfering but more subtly and, and indirectly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So after uh, President Marshall, uh, President Chisano? Yes, actually, President Marshall, he died on an uh, aircraft crash. He was coming from Zambia to Mozambique and then his plane. Uh, crashed was, was in, there an investigation in, done into in that? South Africa. There was an, an, investi in, an investigation, but still there are two lines. One is saying that it was the South Africans who killed President Samuel Michel, who made the plane, who diverted the plane for its route to crash in, in the Muzini Mountains. That's one. But there are others who say because President Michel was so disappointed with the so Soviet bloc that he went to meet President Reagan in Washington via Margaret Thatcher in UK. Then the Soviets, they were not happy with that move. So others say, well, because his plane was a Tupolev from Russia, or from so so Soviet Union then, and even the pilots were Russian. So the, the, there is a second reading where they say that he was killed on, on, on the orders of the Soviets because they were not happy with the changing of policy or more concrete with Samora Michel going to meet Ronald Reagan in, in Washington. There is a third thesis which says that the pilots were just d d drunk. <laughs> As you know, uh, you know, our, our friends from Russia, they, they like their vodka. Uh -huh. so it but they it call it their uh, liquor very well, too. Well, <laughs> that's the point. So, well, I don't know which of the three is truthful, but the point is that mm. Samara Michel died in South Africa on the 19 oct October 1986. Then came President Chisano. Actually, Chisano was Samara Michel's Minister of Foreign Affairs since independence. Oh, wow. So he had a very... 
was it an election or was it no not at because we're the monopart system right. you know and uh, communism or socialism and the one part system Unicorn. you you don't have elections so it was one party it's, it's the um, organs of the party which we who choose the president until 1990 when a peace agreement was negotiated and it was finally signed uh, in 1992 in Rome the, with the support of the Vatican and the Catholic Church. And this was and a peace uh, agreement between Frelimo and Renamo. Uh, between Frelimo and, and Renamo. Uh, I, I mentioned 1990. That was the year which when the new constitution, a multi-party or the first multi-party constitution was introduced in Mozambique allowing for other parties other than Frelimo to exist, allowing other uh, youth organizations to, to exist because up to that time there was allowed only one uh, youth organization which was the Frelimo Youth Wing, one women's organization, one journalist organization and all of them were affiliated to the ruling party but from the 1990 uh, constitution then the political space was liberalized and then two years later or a peace agreement was signed and then two years after the agreement in 1994 the first multi-party elections were organized in Mozambique. Now President Shisano was highly instrumental in this move from Marxism towards capitalism, is that, is that Definitely right? yes. Yeah. Not only from Marxism to social, I mean, I mean to uh, the democracy, to liberal democracy, but also from a command economy into uh, a market economy, because the country was literally bankrupt, and that's why Samara Michel went knocking the doors to West to give him support, because mm -hmm. he had asked support for the Soviet bloc, they said, we don't have money for you, that's why he went to West. So uh, two years before Samara Michel died, mainly in 1984, uh, the World Bank and the IMF signed an agreement with Mozambique so that uh, so they introduced a structural adjustment program, step-by-step uh, -step reforms to transform the then central planned economy into a full market economy. So it, it started in 1984. So when Sabana Marcel died, already the World Bank was negotiating with Mo Mo Mozambique towards that end. Mm. And in 1995, uh, that was also when Mozambique joined the Commonwealth of Nations, right? 1997. 1997. Yes, because I'm very aware of that because I wrote the first brochure explaining why Mozambique should join the Commonwealth. Ah, okay. Wow. Now, um, President uh, Mozambe, he tried to amend the constitution to limit the terms of the, the president. Um, did he succeed in that, the presidency? Oh yes, actually. We, our constitution states that um, the president can only run uh, twice. So we, we as a country succeeded in that. So th there is a limit for, for example, the current president is finishing n next year, his uh, term, then he can run only once. I see. And the previous president, actually the previous president, Mr. Gibuza, he wanted to amend the constitution so, so, so that he, he could run forever, but um, he didn't succeed. Then he tried to put his, his wife, he didn't su succeed. It. So he tried to put more other people, but uh, the country was resilient and resisted his, his moves. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for sharing, sharing with us the, the historical slices of your country. I think it really speaks to the resilience of your country. We're going to take a little short break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk about present day Mozambique. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii. 
every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. To the Global Report, I'm your host, Lily Ong. We have with us today Mayor Manuel Araujo, who is the mayor of Kilimane. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. Well, Mr. Mayor, um, you're here in Singapore for the Mayor's Forum. Um, before we go into that, I want to talk about you and from the time you took over as mayor of the city. That was back in 2011. Yes. And it was not... 30th of December, 2011. 30th of December. And it was not an easy situation to come into. Um, tell us some of the challenges back then and how did you overcome them through these years? Well, the first challenge was that, uh, you know, I'm a university le lecturer. I teach eco eco economics and in international relations. And actually at that point, I went back to my city because I was building uh, uh, my resort. Because I thought that, well, I needed to do something in my hometown. And then as accidentally, or incidentally, the then mayor of my city, he was uh, pushed out on corruption charges. Mm. So at that time, according to, to the Mozambican law, when a mayor is prevented from finishing his mandate, uh, a by-election is called. So a by-election was called, and ev everybody from churches, from the youth and elders were like, well, why, why, why don't you run? I was like, well, I've got my plans. They were like, no, your city needs you, please. So mm -hmm. I had to leave my dreams. I finished, though, my, 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 my lodge, my rear resort, but and then I ran, uh, then I was elected mayor of my city. The first and you won by a pretty comfortable margin. Yes, actually, I, mo I, I won by 64% on the, on, on, on the by-election. And uh, two years later, according to the law, you just finished what the other mayor had already done. So I finished, and two years later, I had normal elections in 2013. There, then I won with 75%, which for me was uh, quite um, thrilling because I didn't expect that I would have moved from 64 to 75 in just two years. Now, which party were you running? Uh, Movement for Democratic Mozambique, MDM, which is a, a non-militarized party. It's a party of young people, youngsters, mm -hmm. and we try with only nine years uh, uh, of a, its existence, it was already running uh, at least until last year. The second city, which is Beira, the third city, which was Nampula, Kelimane City, which is the fourth, and Gugurue, though there were four mun municipalities. And uh, as just to go back to your question, the biggest challenge, the number one challenge was lack of human resources. Because of this uh, kind of socialist model, uh, everybody who was capable from the city, from the provinces, tend to move into the capital. And so... Is it because most of the work, work opportunities? Oh, oh, yes, yeah. because of opportunities and also because of the level of poverty. Because, uh, for example, uh, when I was 18, I had to leave my town because there was no tertiary ed education, there was no university. So I had to go to Maputo, the capital, for further study. So all bright people end up going to the capital and then they, they never come back, of course. Mm -hmm. When they go there, they are 18, 19, 20, they get their girlfriends, they get job there, they marry there, and then... So they settled down there. They never go back home. So yeah. there was this gap in terms of human resource. Up to now, we are trying to fill it in, but it's not easy yeah. to attract people from there. But now also the situation differs. Now, for example, we have five universities in my city. When I was 18 years old, none mm. was there. So human resources was like non, 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 number one. The second, of course, was financial resources. Because I think that... Uh, when you have the right human resources, then you, you can find money. But even if you find money, you may not find the right human resources. So you need to get the balance. And then, of course, the infrastructure of the city was depleted. You have bottom holes in the main streets of the city. Uh, even the provincial governor who lives in my city, because Kelebani is the capital city, he couldn't drive his Mercedes-Benz because of the pothole, so he had to move on 4x4, four four. like everybody was using it for 4x4. Four four. So like one of my biggest challenges was, first of all, 
to get a 100 or 30 degrees in terms of human resources, try to attract youngsters. So I went to university and get young youngsters to come and train them and give them experience. What and were some of the ways that you used to attract them? Uh, I had to explain what was at stake. Uh, and I will use my own experience because I did my, I did my uh, higher, higher education in Maputo, in the capital. Then I went ab ab abroad. I lived in London, in UK, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I did my master's in at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Then I did my PhD at the University of East Anglia. Then I worked for Amnesty International in London. So I had my career, but at some point I was like, well, my country needs me, so I need to go do, do something. So I use my example to attract other youngsters. Say, look, at some point you need to stop and you need to give it back something to your motherland. So by using that uh, example, some people money to come. And of course, you need, you, you need to find other uh, issues. For example, my, the director of communication, uh, he is not from Kelimane, he is from the south. But, uh, you know, because he saw what was happening in Kelimane, you know, a, a young mayor with, you know, with a different discourse. And, like, for example, I made my all campaign uh, using a bike. So I was like the first politician in Mozambique who did his whole campaign on a bike. Of course, it brought an environmental conscience to, 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 to people, but also it's. Um, included, you know, uh, are those who were excluded from the development process, which, which, which were those who were biking, you know. By seeing a mayor biking, they feel more energized, more empowered, and stuff like that. And they feel a connection, too. Exactly. So it's like those small things that, you know, make things, oh, well, look, it looks like there is somebody who is different, with a different discourse, with a different approach, with a different working ethics. Um, and because I don't have money to pay them, you know, what the market would otherwise. So I managed to attract a very ambitious team, and we are working. Uh, and the third challenge was like the language. Kilimane in Zambezia province w w was the only province without an institute of language or an English school. But, you know, in today's world, if you want to thrive, you need to have a minimum command of English. So Is it was Portuguese? The Portuguese, still the no, Portuguese is still the main language, but you need in, in English skills to survive. It's like computer skills. So fortunately, the um, then Minister of, uh, of Education, Dr. Ferrand, he, he, he was my classmate. So I spoke to him. Said, "Look, you know, why is my city the only one, like the only provincial capital, without uh, an, an English school?" So, "Oh, I didn't know that." So, okay, we, we work out on that. So we managed to put now an, an, an English school, so people, people can go there. Stuff. I mean, like those were like the a piecemeal approach that you know we try to put the pieces together and today of course we can tell a successful story wonderful i hope you share that at the mayor's forum well i tried my best mm -hmm. and uh yes we do and we tell that story because we need we still are miles away from what is our dream so we need to learn from others we share also our experience but also we need like to get um other partners, be NGOs, be funders, be uh, philanthropists, who, like, you know, who can get inspired from our example and are willing to help us because we need, the road is still long, I mean. Well, talking about funding, I know one of the sessions at the Mayor's Forum was about how mayors can go about attracting funding. Um, would you mind sharing what were some of the things that you, you learned from the forum place regarding that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I learned, and then after that I met different uh uh, institutions here in, 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 Sing in Singapore dealing with land issues uh, because land is an important asset in my country uh, because you know, we have got this as in inheritance from the old so socialist country? time. Yes. Well, we are 25 million people mm -hmm. and well, we have a very long coastline. We have 3,000 kilometers of coast. Wow. You can see the potential for tourism eh? and, uh, on the Indian Ocean. And your particular city is a seaport. Yes, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a coastal sea, and we have a port there. And another port is going to be built in, in, in the upcoming years, and the new railway uh, linking the heart of the Mozambican mineral resources in Tete province, Mortis, to ship that to abroad uh, through 
the, the port that we will be built. Yes. So at, the, um, at this event, were there you know, different organizations or private companies looking to help other countries or cities? Oh yes, that, that definitely. As I was saying, that uh, one of the things I, 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 I learned from the forum was uh, how to transform an asset that we have, which is land, how to monetize it and get money out of it for future development. For example, I'm looking, I'm desperate to find people who can help me to have a master plan, a proper master plan, because my city doesn't have a proper master plan. That's like, to me, it's like number one challenge that I'm, I'm, I'm facing. I don't have the expertise, I don't have the money, so it's very difficult because there are very good companies here. You know, I contacted some companies here like Sabana, like DK Architects and the others, but they say, well, we've got the expertise, but you need to find somebody who can fund. But I've been con co contacting, for example, you, 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 you and Habitat and others, but most of these students don't have money, so like, you know, the issue is between an egg and the chicken, what comes first? Well, I need a master plan to be able to attracting investment, but others say, well, you need money to pay for the master plan. So it's a challenge, but uh, I'm confident that somehow we will manage to cross that um, challenge and uh, be able of getting somebody somewhere in this world who will be wanting to fund our master plan so that we can move ahead because a city without a master plan is like a ship in the, in the high sea without a bussola like you don't know where you are going but doesn't your country have rich and extensive resources we do have but the point is like they are unexploited resources so we need Someone. to a roadmap that will take us and bring the like for example i don't agree with this what is happening in in, in my country now it's like we are exporting raw raw material like uh, uh thousand and thousand of tons of timber wood is being export cut and uh, exported to china and in in other countries like other companies like from spain from china from japan are there they are fishing without any processing they're just ship shipping all the fish that they get. Uh, for example, there are other like Chinese companies, like they are taking uh, precious sand, like heavy sand there, raw, uh, like coal. Every day, more than 50 huge trains are taking coal from Tete, mm. shipping out. Like we need to build industry, we need to process the, the raw materials to give value so, so, so that we can, we can maximize the whole value chain. By then, if we do that, we will create em employment, uh, we will get more resources, then we will learn. Because in the process of pro 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 producing or of transforming the raw materials, Mozambicans also will learn the skills. We'll have, uh, there will be a transfer of technology and of work ethics and, and, and so on. So somehow, somewhere, we need to stop and say, well, wait, enough is enough. We need to attract those who have technology to come and put and install their factories in our country rather than exploiting unprocessed raw materials. Well, um, I think that China has been quite successful going around Africa, either in exchange of land or in exchange of um, min, um, resources to provide them with infrastructure. Do you see that happening? Yes, yeah, of course. In, in Mozambique, uh, they are in the timber business. They are cutting timber and take egg exporting in the fisheries, in mining. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's not only China. Other countries are, are doing the, the same. So we are like uh, a reservoir of raw materials, mm -hmm. unprocessed raw materials, which are being exported. We need to change the development model. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure, uh, create attractive conditions for foreign direct investment, but an investment which creates jobs, which okay. creates opportunity, which trains the labor, which upgrades the labor, which skills the labor, thus adding value to the raw ma materials that we do possess. Mozambique is a very rich country, but because of wrong policies, mm -hmm. because of the wrong development model, we are still very, very poor. We need to change that. But just to um, cast a positive light, um, your G GDP growth is actually one of the highest in the world, even though the GDP per capita is, is still low, but your GDP growth yeah, is actually one of, of the highest. Of course, too. because when a country is coming from too low, when it implements some decisions, of course, 
one of the impacts will be like a, a very high GDP growth. But I think that on in the in the medium and long run, it will stabilize. And what we want is not just G GDP growth, which is doesn't reflect on the people of the country. We want an inclusive growth, a growth not uh, only uh, technical or capital intensive techniques, but we want an invest foreign direct investment, which is also labor in intensive, because it's through labor that uh, income is redistributed mm -hmm. and that the people can feel the benefit. Because if people don't feel the benefit, they will go against that development model, and then we will end up either like South, South Africa or like B Brazil with high rates of crime and homicides and, and so on. We, we want to build an harmonious society. I think one of the candidates I emulate is uh, Singapore, where in 40 years, you manage to move from an underdeveloped country to a developed country. I hope we can uh, learn something from Singapore. I hope we can learn so something from other countries so that uh, we can take, because like, if you look at the level of uh, uh, mortality rates in my country are just astonishing. It's a pain uh, exercise to, to make, but I think we, if the rights path of development is established, then in very short term, we can follow into Singapore's steps, or footsteps. Okay. Hope for that to happen too. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have just a few minutes left. Um, since you used to work for Amnesty International, I understand you were in the you know, human rights area. Yes. What are your thoughts on the present day situation you know, with the immigrants, refugees? Well. The issue of refugees is uh, an important issue, or, or migrants, but uh, it underlines another problem, which is a development problem. Because my question is, why are these people leaving their home? I don't think that anyone, you know, if you are happy at your home, you leave your home to go somewhere else. People go, people migrate because the conditions at their home are not good. Be economic be political or other, security. and actually security actually. And in most countries, uh, for example, Latin America or Africa, the low development level of those countries make that th those regimes in power, they become too secret minded. And uh, so they threat the security of the individual. That's why people leave. But the solution is not to build walls. Actually, I think that's a very stupid uh, answer. The solution is to, is to promote development in those countries so that people don't feel the need to move. As simple as that. So, but you may put uh, a wall there, but people will find a way to go. And for as long as weapons are being supplied to those yes. regions, the war will just That's keep going point. on. Yeah. So well, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I wish we had more time, but thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank, thank you Thank so you. Much. Thank you very much. And enjoy your, the rest of your stay in Singapore. It, it was my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you.